welcome everyone to our IFRR Robotics Colloquium. Today we are uh, coming together to have a conversation on uh, soft robotics. And I would like to welcome everyone on the call. We have a couple of speakers as well as front row guests. And in a few moments, I will share a slide deck to introduce everyone. My name is Robert Ketchman. I am uh, a professor at ETH, and I'm pleased to moderate today's panel and to guide you through the session. We will be spending the next 90 minutes together, and we will have a few presentations, time to ask questions. If you would like to ask questions, you use Slido for this. The information for Slido was shared in uh, preparation to this meeting. And we will also have our front row guests that will be making sure that questions are being asked around uh, the key topics that we're trying to address today. So with this, I will share first our few slides to introduce the topic. As a motivation to our panel today, I'm uh, gonna start off with something I always like to, to share and conversations about soft robotics of why, why do we care about this field? Why do we care about soft robots? And the best way to introduce this is to just look at nature and into various bio inspirations. And so you see here on the top left, uh, a black marlin that is one of the fastest swimmers in the world. It's following um, a lute here that is uh, being sent out from a boat. And you see it's, it's incredibly fast and it use, uses its deformable soft body to do this fast swimming. And on top right, you see an octopus that is uh, very deformable, highly dexterous, and it's also a very intelligent creature. And it uses all its deformable and soft tentacles to, uh, to capture uh, its prey here within the small cage. And so it can deform and can enter the space. And similarly here on the left, you, you see a spider monkey being able to ele elegantly climb through the forest and is capable of using all its limbs and its tail to deform and move around. And finally, there's the cheetah, which we all know is one of the fastest runners in the world. And it's not only a fast runner, but it's also very maneuverable and capable of, of hunting uh, it's incredibly fast other animals. So with this as a motivation, I would like to uh, introduce the questions and the topic of the day. So we'll be speaking about soft robotics and we will be looking into the works of our panel guests, but we'll also try to answer a few questions. So just for the general audience to understand, if I were to just try one of the many different ways of defining soft robotics, one way would be to say, it's an integrative way of creating and controlling embodied intelligence. Is how do you bring together control and creation using soft and rigid elements, sensors, and other modalities to build robots that can mimic uh, other bio-inspired creatures as we just saw. And so here on the top, I, saw, I showed just um, showcasing a couple of works by the speakers that will probably be touching on those works today. And our panel will be talking about their ongoing research and also about open research problems. And for sure, there will be time for you to ask via Slido questions such as where do soft robots excel? What topic areas in soft robotics need main attention? Which technologies are most promising within soft robotics and most promising for like wider applications in robotics? And finally, we will be looking into will soft robotics actually be essential for solving the canonical robotics challenges? Our first speaker will be Professor Cecilia Lashi from uh, the National University of Singapore. And then we will have Michael Tolley, Professor Michael Tolley from UC San Diego in the USA. Then we will have Professor Rob Shepard from Cornell University in the USA. And then going back around the globe again, we will have Professor Ryuma Niyama speaking from the University of Tokyo. Very late today for him joining this call. And finally, I will also give a presentation on some of my group's research. I'm joining from ETH Zurich in Switzerland. We also have 
front row guests that will be joining in during the call and will be able to ask questions directly to the speakers. And this is Christian de Rie from INRIA, Kyu Jin Jo from Seoul National University, Rebecca Kramer Boticlio from Yale University, and Pablo Valdivia E. Alvarado from the Singapore University of Technology and Design. And with this, I would like to hand over the, the word to our first panel guest, which is Cecilia, please. It's all yours. I will stop the share now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, let me share my screen now. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Thanks to Osama and Paolo for inviting me. I'm very happy to open this colloquium. And I'll try to answer some of the questions that uh, Robert already <laughs> raised in, in his introduction with a short journey from robotics challenges to soft robotics and back. Uh, but actually, let me um, start this journey from, I mean, backward. <laughs> so from the canonical robotics challenges that uh, Robin mentioned, so what we dream for our robots as robotics is, is that they find their applications and uh, we would like to provide them with uh, better abilities, uh, usually in these two uh, big domains of robotics that are manipulation and locomotion. And we need to develop some new robotics technologies and maybe look at uh, new principles and models for that. So let's start this journey from this very first step. Uh, can, um, can we take lessons from, from nature? And of course, yes, we can. It was mentioned already. It's bio-inspiration, so-called bio-inspiration. Uh, was it about? Uh, um, actually, usually we choose our model from biology, not necessarily a human being like in this picture. And uh, we uh, try to take lessons, but we tend to forget that what we are observing, it's actually the uh, result of evolution. And evolution is based on natural selection. So what we are observing is basically the result of incremental adaptations. It's not optimal design as we uh, used to in, in engineering and robotics. So that's why uh, bioinspiration is not about coping but it is about understanding, extracting some key principles that can be helpful in, in robotics. And uh, uh, we know a big lesson was mentioned also in, in the introduction is embodied intelligence because with embodied intelligence, uh, uh, we give uh, um, a, a role to the body and the behavior can emerge from the interaction of the body with the environment. So in a nutshell, body matters and control is simplified if we are able to. I take into account. And personally, I learned a lot about uh, uh, embodied intelligence from an octopus, because if you observe it's a uh, uh, rich in movement, uh, you see it's a bending wave propagating from the base to the tip. And of course, it is the smartest movement in water. And of course, there are many muscles involved, many degrees of freedom if you want. Uh, but if you take uh, a completely passive thing like, like this uh, uh, silicon uh, cone with same morphology, same mechanical properties and same environment, uh, you see that you uh, observe a similar bending wave just from the interaction with water. And actually, uh, if you go into the biology of this, uh, uh, the control of this movement, you find that the brain of the animal only controls three parameters. So again, body matters and control is simplified. Few parameters for many degrees of freedom. The same we found for pulse jet swimming. If you are able to uh, respect the morphology, the mechanical properties, the fluid dynamics involved in this movement, then control is very simple. We could build this simple robot which has just one degree of freedom. So again, body matters and control is highly simplified. Um, we also learned from, uh, from, from the octopus and then from other uh, marine animals that it is possible to walk underwater with legs. What the octopus does is to use the tool of the back uh, arms uh, that becomes legs, um, back with respect to the movement and push the body forward because uh, it raises the body. And 
We observe something similar in crabs. So they use just a few of the legs and they push the body forwards with long flight phases. And those are very interesting uh, self-stabilizing gates. So body matters and control is simplified again for this reason. Okay, so uh, very nice by inspired principles, but uh, they give us also a lot of challenges in terms of technologies. Uh, and it, the technologies that we need to implement them. And actually soft robotics uh, are developed especially around this, uh, these many uh, new technologies. I mean, new for robotics, especially. So here we have um, a very important contribution from material science. So uh, we could just some new, uh, some smart materials like uh, shape memory uh, alloys uh, for actuating our robots or uh, electroactive polymers. Uh, fluidic actuation is widely um, common in, uh, in soft robotics. So they are more specific uh, actuation mechanism like twisting and coil or jamming for, for stiffening. And there are many more than this, of course, also for sensing that I, I cannot mention. But what I want to say is that uh, uh, these uh, technologies that we explored in soft robotics uh, enabled uh, um, our robots to achieve abilities that were not possible before. Uh, more biomorphic, if you want, abilities uh, like um, uh, self-healing, if you use the self-healing materials or growing, or I mean, uh, morphing like shortening, elongation, or very uh, nice things like the robots with the vascular system that uh, uh, Rob uh, uh, developed, or just, I mean, adaptable grasping, interesting for industry. And this is a very recent result that was published a couple of weeks ago in Nature. I wanted to, to show it because it's a, a completely soft robot that reached the, the Mariana Trench <laughs> uh, because uh, it's completely soft and the small, the few rigid parts, uh, the electronics, for example, are, are distributed inside, embedded inside the soft body. And that was inspired by the distributed skeletal system of this uh, um, fish living living in, in the depths of the oceans. So I think it's a, um, an interesting result in this sense. So, um, okay, by inspired principle, we observe them. Uh, we are good at finding the, 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 the good ones. And we are roboticists. We can already build uh, some robots out of them. But it is only when we can abstract the principles into mathematical models that uh, they become usable for designing a robot, for designing a robot for an intended application. And that will be our by inspired robot that doesn't need to be to have the same shape or same appearance as our initial model. It will be by inspired because it embeds, embeds the principle that we have uh, investigated. Um, in our group, we, we did so for the underwater leg locomotion case. That's uh, especially Marcello Calisti's work. Uh, he proposed the use slip, so um, a modification of the slip model that takes into account some parameters related to the water environment. Uh, and actually, the model relates uh, in very nicely the morphology with the self-stabilizing gates. So again, body matters and control becomes simple because uh, gates are self-stabilizing. And he built uh, um, this simple robot to show, to verify the model. Uh, and, and you see uh, it, it shows some static and dynamic gates uh, with, again, very low energy consumption, thanks to the self-stabilization and especially in a session keeping, as you see in the last part of the, of the videos. So now we have the model, we can uh, design a robot for an application and that's our Silver 2 that was designed in, in the Blue Resolution project funded by RB, a company in Italy. And that was designed to uh, take some samples of the sediments to look for microplastics. And we also tested it uh, actually with uh, a soft arm that uh, was developed by our colleagues at uh, Beihang University. 
Li Wen's group uh, for, uh, I mean, for collecting uh, larger <laughs> plastic uh, waste like uh, this, uh, this plastic battle. And there are many other applications uh, for soft robots already in the biomedical field. There are many, these are just a few examples from, from our group, but uh, there are really uh, fantastic examples uh, uh, worldwide. So let me give another final message about bioinspiration. When we observe our, our model, there is another thing that we tend to forget, <laughs> uh, which is that, uh, uh, it is usually an adult that we observe, but uh, uh, it is not uh, um, just as we observe it, but it is the result of growth and development. Uh, and uh, we um, assume that our robots are already uh, grown up when we build them, and uh, we uh, assume that they should have all the abilities already. But we could probably, with soft robotics, with soft robotics technologies and the abilities that they enable, we can probably dream of robots with a, a life cycle. So we can uh, think of them that are uh, born somehow and then grow and then evolve and learn the, the tasks that they have to do. And they can even adapt their shape to those uh, tasks and uh, heal themselves, find their energy and hopefully biodegrade at the end of their um, life. Um, so a summary of my short journey from bio-inspired principles, we obtained very nice, uh, interesting technological challenges and developed uh, new uh, technologies, I mean, soft robotics technologies that enabled uh, uh, further abilities for robots, uh, lifelike abilities. And in turn, they are enabling hopefully further applications for our robot, uh, more sustainable robots, uh, hopefully uh, contributing to the global uh, sustainable development. Okay, so uh, thanks for listening. Let me thank the people who worked on this, uh, uh, the Biorobotics Institute uh, uh, in Italy, while uh, you can reach me now at the National University of Singapore. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cecilia. Thank you for your nice presentation. So in our continuation, we will directly continue with the second presentation. And this will be Michael Tolley, Professor Michael Tolley from UCSD. Please, it's all yours. Go ahead. Great, thanks, Robert. Let me just uh, <clears throat> get my presentation on the right screen here. Okay, so hopefully you're seeing my uh, my slides. It. It looks good. Great. Okay, uh, so I'm just going to jump into it. Um, thank you, Chichila, for the fantastic introduction. So uh, you know, uh, as we were just discussing, we're very much mode inspired by uh, some of these fantastic soft creatures like the octopus that you see here um, that, that by virtue of, of having soft bodies can, uh, you know, simplify the solution of a, a wide range of tasks that we care about in robotics. And so, you know, common examples that we often think about uh, for soft robots um, are uh, the ability to simplify interaction with humans, uh, to achieve versatile manipulation and uh, to, to simplify uh, interactions with a complex environment. So what I will talk about, um, you know, my group at, at UCSD uh, focuses on a, a wide range of, of sort of bio-inspired solutions. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is just briefly some of the recent projects we've been working on. Um, and, and, you know, the three questions here that I'm going to touch on are, how can uh, soft legs or soft components of, of a robot simplify walking? Um, how can we uh, control stiffness uh, to be useful in various uh, robotics applications? And, uh, and also I'll touch on, on how a soft body can be beneficial for swimming. So 
Um, this is uh, a video from old work with uh, Rob Shepard, who's here, as well as my uh, postdoc uh, advisor, Rob Wood, and George Whitesides. And we looked at uh, you know, how to make a, a soft walking robot. And this is sort of a first uh, a stab at this challenge. Um, but, but this, you know, I bring this up now just to, to raise some of the sort of outstanding challenges with uh, making a, a soft walking robot, including how do you make it? Um, how do you make it move quickly? Uh, how do you make it able to um, move through more complex environments that aren't sort of flat ground? Um, you know, how do we uh, achieve control, especially if you want to do some sort of onboard, uh, untethered uh, um, control of these types of, of robots? And then, of course, integrating sensing. And, uh, and if we wanted to make something move underwater, what would that look like? So these are all the kinds of challenges that we're thinking about in my group. Um, I'm not going to address all of them today, but uh, just to talk a little bit more about this um, dexterous, improving the dexterity of walking. Uh, one thing we've been thinking about uh, for a little while is how to, to have multi uh, degree of freedom actuators like the one you see here with three pneumatic uh, chambers. We take advantage of digital manufacturing capabilities um, to make sort of uh, these, these complex bellowed shapes that you just saw. Um, and, uh, and so we can now control uh, two angles as well as extension with the pressures in these three chambers and putting these onto the body, uh, using these as the legs essentially for a walking robot. Um, we have uh, you know, tested the ability of, of this system to walk on different terrains. And so without even adapting the gate controller, um, we found that you know, on a variety of terrains, the system uh, performs uh, relatively well. And, uh, and so this is sort of a, you know, this concept of embodied intelligence where you don't have to um, get too fancy on the controller. Of course, you have the potential to think more about control and that's something that we're doing now, optimizing controllers. Um, but even before you do any of that, you can handle a lot of, of complex uh, uh, situations. Um, so, you know, the, the challenge, if I, if I just go back to this, these videos for a second here, the challenge is the part that you're not seeing with a lot of these videos where all these tubes are going off, off screen and then we have a pressure source and a bank of valves um, telling the uh, actuators when to inflate or the, the sort of chambers, pneumatic chambers of these legs when to inflate. Uh, so we were thinking about, okay, we'd like to make an untethered system. How can we do that on board in a practical way? And uh, there was some nice work that came out of, of the Whitesides group recently, looking at uh, using valves, uh, soft valves as memory elements to generate, uh, for example, a soft ring oscillator. Okay, and, and this is fantastic work. And you know, really you can sort of mechanically program the, the period of oscillation and the generation of these sequential pressures into these physical components. And so we thought, how can we um, take advantage of that for a walking robot? And the idea was is sort of roughly inspired by central pattern generators in nature, where you any rhythmic motion that you see in nature is generally uh, powered or controlled by a central pattern generator circuit. And um, so we took one of these soft ring oscillators as sort of the basis and built on top of that. We thought about what are the simple, simplest um, gate controllers we could build on top of this kind of soft ring oscillator. And so this is one of the, the very simplest approaches where you can generate a um, diagonal couplet gate actuating two um, diagonal legs on a quadruped in, in, uh, together uh, to achieve some sort of walking motion. Okay, this is you know, perhaps not the most optimized walking motion, but um, we are now able to lift our legs up off of the ground and potentially uh, handle rougher terrain. And then we thought about how do we how do we adapt this gate to, for example, um, move in different directions. Um, so in this uh, example here, uh, we have a constant pressure source going to this robot. So again, there's no valves aside from the soft valves uh, that are generating these these uh, sequential uh, actuations. Um, but uh, we have a manual controller here where we're saying, okay, we can select the connections between our soft ring oscillator and the legs in order to change the direction of locomotion uh, to, to move in a square. And then we can even put uh, all that on board with a um, tactile sensor. So in this case, this tactile sensor has a fluidic transmission. And as soon as we run into a wall, just like a Roomba robot, 
you want to go in the opposite direction, we can directly um, interface this tactile sensor with the brain, essentially to, to flip a, a bit in the brain, to flip one the state of one of these valves and have the robot move in the opposite direction. So this is work that we recently reported in uh, Science Robotics. And, um, and, and I think this is exciting because now you can do all this without electronics. You can imagine scenarios where you want a, a soft walking robot that does not have uh, onboard electronics, potentially, uh, for example, in, in, in uh, environments, uh, for example, where you have a risk of spark ignition, like a mine shaft or, or a grain silo. Um, Okay, but getting back to the general challenges, you know, our thought was we make the soft walking robot and then we're in San Diego, we can take it to the beach and show that that's an environment that it works well on. Uh, of course, you know, these are the videos you don't, we don't normally show, um, but the, uh, you know, we put this in the sand and it does exactly the opposite, right? It, we made sort of a good digger perhaps, but not a very good walker. And so this has motivated a whole uh, other, uh, avenue of research where we've been thinking about walking on complex substrates, granular substrates like sand. And, um, and a, a student in my group, Emily, and this is work with uh, Nick Gravish at UCSD, has been thinking about how uh, we can change the stiffness of, for example, the feet of a walking robot to handle these kinds of complex uh, substrates. Um, this is inspired, the way that we change stiffness is inspired by previous work from actually my PhD mentor, Hod Lipson's group, um, which uses the concept of granular jamming, okay? So if you can find a, a granular medium, uh, you can change its stiffness. And, um, and so here they show uh, using that effect to achieve uh, gripping. Uh, we essentially put these sort of granular grippers on the feet of this uh, hexapod robot. And there's some details here I'm not going to get into. We have to look at shear stiffening because the first thing that happens is these things want to just uh, fail on a shear. But if you handle that, we wanted to ask how could, uh, you know, could soft feet um, improve walking? And uh, if we can control when during the gait cycle the feet are soft, uh, can the foot adapt to, for example, uh, you know, rocks or pebbles and then stiffen in order to push off of it, right? And so long story short, just jumping to some of the results here, uh, this is our robot walking on, on pebbles and uh, leaf litter, uh, you know, um, wood chips, for example. And what we found is um, we actually were able to increase the, the speed of this robot on these complex substrates using uh, jamming at the right point in the gait cycle, okay? So you put your foot down when it's soft, you jam it, and then you push off. Uh, what we also found, which I thought was kind of interesting, was on, in some cases, for example, flat ground, we didn't actually have to actively jam the feet. So just the weight of the robot itself tends to uh, stiffen the foot. And we even noted a, a benefit from passive jamming. So that kind of hints at a, a potential new direction. Maybe we'll see, you know, running shoes uh, with, with granular jamming in them somehow. But that's a, a whole other topic. Um, while we're thinking about variable stiffness, I just wanted to mention we've been thinking about various different ways to achieve this variable stiffness. Um, one challenge with this kind of granular jamming approach is if you have any sort of bending, um, you, you're going to get some failure at some point where your bending stiffness is limited by the tension you can hold in your elastic membrane that's surrounding these grains. Um, so people have looked at can you uh, achieve variable stiffness bending with uh, layer jamming, where you have essentially layers of materials that you pressurize together to stiffen. Um, we recently reported, and other groups have at a similar time been working on uh, the concept of fiber jamming. So uh, you can achieve uh, bending in multiple planes if you have a bundle of fibers that you compress together. And uh, so my student Sarab, who you see here, has been thinking about this, thinking about how to model uh, fiber jamming actuators. You get something that converts from a relatively soft, uh, long slender element to something that you can see here lifts a weight. And he's also used this as a haptic interface uh, with this clever application where he reduces the stiffness when the balloon pops and you can feel that reduction in stiffness in this VR environment. Uh, so this is actually um, reported recently in, the, in soft robotics. Okay, the last thing I'll talk about quickly here 
is uh, swimming. I know Robert later is going to talk about, he already showed a nice video of his swimming robot. So I thought uh, we, we'd talk about some of our work in this area, which is uh, inspired by cephalopods. And Cecilia also has some very nice work that I'll mention. But the key point here, focusing on the prin principles, as Cecilia mentioned, is um, if you look at how the squid swims, um, first of all, it has a soft body, so you don't, you know, you potential, potentially have some advantages if you want to study nature or operate around humans by having a soft bodied robot. Um, the way the squid uh, achieves swimming, it fills up, swells its body with water, and then pushes it out and has this periodic, uh, generates these periodic jets. One of the key uh, points, uh, you know, that the biologists tell us. And, and, and fluid me mechanicians uh, tell us is that if you um, change the effective added mass of your body as you're jetting, you get an increased acceleration, okay? So you want the pro frontal projected area of your robot to decrease and, and you notice an increase in efficiency and speed as a result. Uh, so this was the, the challenge that we wanted to investigate in this work. As I mentioned, there's previous work that has done this with a one-shot kind of uh, example that we see here on the left. And from Cecilia's group, there's this fantastic work that showed that you can do cyclic uh, pulse jetting, um, but the frontal projected area of this particular design is, is relatively constant. So we were interested in looking at a, a design that had this uh, change, this could, could harness this added, ma added mass effect. Uh, here you see the basic me mechanism. It's very simple uh, slip um, uh, decimated gear uh, rack and pinion uh, uh, mechanism. So that part itself is not soft, but the body itself, the body contains uh, a sort of um, uh, takes in the energy from this mechanism and then releases it in a pulse. And so we were able to look at some of these parameters, like the effect of nozzle di diameter, which is known to be important. You want to tune your nozzle so you have uh, as much of your water getting out during the pulse as possible. Um, and, and wrapping up into one single um, vortex, as you see on the right case, as opposed to multiple vortices, as we see if the nozzle is too small. Um, but uh, just in the interest of time, I'm very happy to, to talk more about this if anyone has questions. But we looked at, um, OK, now can we make an untethered uh, swimming robot using this type of, of propulsion? Uh, we did some very uh, basic characterization of how we could do steering. We haven't achieved that on board yet. Uh, but we found, sure enough, consistent with previous literature, that for a formation number, uh, which is the ratio of your uh, water expelled to diameter, essentially around four, uh, we got very efficient swimming. And um, and this is something we haven't tested out in the wild. This is something we tested the Birch Aquarium at UCSD. So you can see a little bit of the potential here for, for studying nature with this type of system. OK, so these are uh, some of our funding sources and collaborators. But most importantly, I want to mention the fantastic students at UCSD that have been uh, working on these projects. Thank you very much, Mike. Thank you for the presentation. Now we're going over into a, a phase of having the chance to get some questions from our front row guests. Who would like to go first? Uh, Rebecca, please. Yeah, very nice talks. Thank you so much. Um, I have a question for, for both of you, Cecilia and Mike. Um, you both touched on embodied intelligence, and I have observed kind of two narratives about this. So there's this idea of embodied intelligence and that we can simplify control via the soft body dynamics of, of soft robots and their interactions with the environments. But then simultaneously, uh, I'm aware that soft bodied control is considered to be a huge challenge. Um, you know, everyone talks about the difficulties and the, the challenges associated with soft body control. So I'm wondering if you can comment on these kind of contrasting narratives on the, the challenge of soft body control, but also the simplifications afforded by soft bodies. Um, I don't know if Mike wants to start or I start. Uh, uh -huh. So I, I must admit I have this uh, schizophrenia inside myself. <laughs> You're perfectly right, uh, Rebecca. You you really got the, the, the right point here because we, okay, we build soft robots to simplify control. Then after we have a soft robot uh, as roboticist, we just want to control it in the very same way we did, we used to do with, with traditional robots. So that's a sort of, uh, yeah, contrasting 
interest. So uh, I perfectly agree with you. Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, we should go for the embodied intelligence way of controlling uh, soft robots. I'm, I think they can a bit converge. I mean, uh, you know that our group especially uses uh, learning-based uh, approaches to control. And I think that when you do the learning on the physical robot, then somehow the if you use the neural network, it encodes encodes the, the, the embodied intelligence in it. Yeah, I, I, I agree absolutely. I think that, um, you know, we have sort of two goals in robotics, right? One is to see what is possible, what, what capabilities are, are possible, and then another goal is to solve a problem. And, and so um, one potential place where embodied intelligence, I think, can be useful is when you already know what your challenge is. If you're trying to make a specific medical device, for example, you want it to be as easy to control as possible. You want it to be as simple as possible. Maybe you build some of the solution into the body of the design, right? Um, in the most general case, just for robotics, for our, um, you know, for the challenge, we're interested in, can we control, you know, all these complex degrees of freedom? Or, or can we uh, formalize uh, how you, one would control a soft robot? And I think that's, uh, um, and there may be applications where that level of, of complexity is necessary, right? So I, I, think there's, I think there's space for both is, is basically what I'm saying. And I think that's okay. Thank you. Uh, Pablo, do you wanna go next? Yes, thank you for the talk, uh, for the talks rather, very interesting. So my question is a little related to the earlier question uh, regarding control. Can you guys comment on the, and, and my question is related uh, to tailoring the dynamics of uh, soft robot bodies, right? Because I think that plays a, a big role in being able to control and and in, in influence how they operate being soft robots being underactuated devices. Can you comment on the importance of fabrication in this area? You know, you, you both showed very interesting robots uh, that uh, were uh, reached that with unconventional approaches to fabrication, at least from the sense of traditional robotics. Right? So, so could you comment on your fabrication efforts in that, in that area? Maybe we swap and uh, Mike, you go first. <laughs> yeah, sure. I mean, I think, you know, thinking about the squid robot, for example, that I showed last, one of the things that uh, is important is, you know, your design of your mechanism is going to determine how quickly it pulses. The way that we had designed it, we, we store this energy in the body and then it releases, it's going to release at the rate that determined by the, the dynamics of the system. Um, so, uh, you're absolutely right. I mean, you, you have to consider the dynamics in, in terms of, and, and that's going to influence how you fabricate the device. Um, but I don't know if I'm missing a point on, on uh, uh, is that sort of what you're getting at, Pablo, or did I miss something there? Right, right, right. So, so my point is that um, to facilitate control to some degree, you have to be, you have to have the capability of tailoring to some degree the dynamics of your system. Right yeah. to basically yeah. make, make your life easier to do what uh, to, to have your robot do what you want, right. and that is enabled uh, in a, in a great sense by the design, but also by, by, by your fabrication capabilities, right? Uh, how you fabricate the device, so that poses some challenges, right, in robotics. And, and you guys have uh, very beautiful devices, and uh, and that part, part a big part of that I assume was enabled by by the way you fabricate or the way you have to figure out how to fabricate these things. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and just to you know, add on what I said, I think one of the interesting things about uh, soft bodies, especially complex soft bodies, is at some point we have to do that computationally, right? We have to do, in order to determine the dynamics of, of this complex bellowed shape, for example, you, you probably have to do uh, some uh, analysis, FEA analysis, and, and then to solve the inverse problem of tailoring the dynamics um, that, that becomes an intra a complex but interesting interplay. Um, I, I don't know that I have a simple answer beyond that, but I, I think it's a good challenge. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Pablo, for the questions. So in, in the interest of time, we have to move to the next speaker. 
Um, and so please, Rob, it's all yours, Rob Shepherds. Okay, hello. I will share my screen. The, the, and I made a few changes to my talk from the one I practiced earlier, so hopefully it's still plays. I have, like the IFR our, uh, colloquia on quadrupeds, I inserted a soft, ro soft robot into the, into the title slide. It's but great. I think that was the Boston Dynamics representative from before. And this is uh, what that one is. This is something Mike and I worked on a while ago. Um, and to be honest, I, I, I'm not sure. I, there, I'm sure there are bigger soft robots that have been made on land, Elastomeric, but um, this is just the one that I'm most familiar with. Uh, the problem with it um, in, is a mass transport problem. At the original scale of like 14 centimeters, it's not pain, it's painfully slow, but uh, it's, you know, I can still show a video at real time. The inflation of the, this big one though, that's, that's a problem even at quite high pressure differentials. Um, if you go the other direction and make it half the size, then it kind of just runs along, um, which is nice. So uh, as there are ways to address this that are being addressed now, but let's just say this is what the systems are working on. Um, increased size, cost payload capacity um, and speed. Um, you, can, you can start to work on this with different material systems that allow you to use higher pressure differentials and higher stresses in the, in the rubbers. And that's, that's an, an axis to exploit. Um, and, but one, one thing our bodies do is um, use higher surface area and not just our bodies, like everything in biology uses high surface area to volume ratios. Um, there's Murray's law for fluid transport in leaves. Um, uh, if you, I'll, I'll get to this later, but our vascular system is an example of how to do mass transport effectively. Um, and so that's, that's an option here, but there are other ways there. This is a big robot that I think we, most of us probably remember from other lab where they're walking around with their kids on it. Um, the, in this case though, what they're giving up for high tensile strength for fabrics, which allow high pressures is um, uh, um, actuation amplitude of, of the actuators. So they don't move very much and it kind of just moves along like that. And there, there are material ways to address this as well. But no matter what, not no matter what, but we're definitely not close to this right now. Um, and there's a variety of reasons, like motors have been, you know, electric motors, DC motors, they've been under development for a hundred years. Um, and we've been working on our actuator 200 years and we've been working on our actuators for decades. Synthetic polymer is capable of making the types of systems at least I work with have only been around since World War II. Um, and then the scale of production um, the last 40 years and the quality of silicones that we now use 30 years. So there's been, been a, a time scale lag there. And it's not only that, um, but we have as much as we talk about how great biology is and how we want to use it, um, we do have severe disadvantage in that uh, biology doesn't use metal um, because of the high temperature processes required to uh, reduce the metal oxides into large amounts of metal that we can then form into very high stiffness to weight ratio structures, which, um, and then, and similarly though, even in, even in, um, though biology is full of elastomers, um, we've only had them for a short period of time, even plastics like Bakelite, um, that's like a hundred years old. So the synthetic production of, um, engineering grade polymers hasn't been around for very long. Um, but there are many advantages as we, as we heard from Cecilia and, um, and Mike, uh, about you using biology to inspire us. The great thing about elastomers is that they are room temperature controlled processes. Um, there's a lot of, now that we understand synthesis, we can build from the bottom up the materials to do what we want. And what's interesting and different about elastomers than um, more polymers than metals and ceramics so that they're entropy driven um, energetics. So the using the affine network model here, which is means they can all move around and past each other and occlude each, uh, the um, solid volume, you don't consider it, as well as the enthalpic interactions, you throw that out too. But even if you throw all that out, it's you get some real physics from it. And I won't 
after you take free energy, the derivative, and then by the area, you get a modulus, and that modulus is dependent on the number density of polymer chains and, and the temperature. And we can see in hydrogels, the hydrogels have very low elastic modulus, which we know, and that's because we can get the number density of chains quite low. You know, many hydrogels are 10% actual polymer and 90% water. And then we can go up the scale. I just randomly chose polyurethanes, but you can get polyurethanes below silicone, silicones above polyurethanes, but in many cases, it's the number density of polymer chains is controlling this. And we, so we have a, a synthetic lever to control um, the material properties to exquisite detail. Um, and we can do this, and we throw this away many times, I think, in our field that we can mold or we can 3D print these things, which is a huge convenience um, that we're all taking advantage of. Uh, but I think we should be more explicit about that. And of course, to get some, to something like an octopus. And so what we've done in the field is uh, take advantage of buoyant support uh, to ameliorate some of the problems of not having really high stiffness to weight ratio um, structures that give us continuum deformations, which is what one of the things we're relying on. Um, so, uh, but what biology does for this is they have bones. And so that's why I think another reason, another area in which uh, soft robotics has been, I would say successful and will be successful is in haptics or wearable systems because our body provides the rigid substrate in which, for which to press against or uh, be pressed upon. Um, so the future as I think many of us recognize is probably in hybrid hard soft systems of which there are also many um, from, I put, sorry, I didn't mean to put two of my own things on here that PowerPoint did that without my knowledge. But uh, anyway, so this is an, uh, a worm with a hard auger on it. Um, we, we saw this at Robosoft in Korea. That was a pretty cool demo. Uh, we'll be may hopefully seeing this uh, for the next speaker. And anyway, so it's an exciting time. But another thing we can do besides hybrid systems is embrace complexity. Because we have the ability to build from the bottom up with additive manufacturing, I think we shouldn't be scared about working on really complicated things. That will, that um, even, you know, Atlas from Boston Dynamics, is, it has a lot of tubes running in it, but we deal with that every day. Like we can make more complex systems than they can. Um, and, and see, you know, then we of course have to work with people who are really good at controls and a lot, and some of the panelists here are, I am not, but some of my students are. Um, so we are making, um, to touch on the area of complexity, we're using robot nerves and robot blood. Anybody who works in stretchable sensors, you know, I'm just using the ones we use, which are stretchable light guides, but stretchable capacitors, stretchable resistors. I'm talking about embracing complexity here, not the particulars of a type of sensor. And then, um, you know, the idea of blood or energy carrying fluids. Um, but in order to do either of these, you need to be okay working in complex systems. Um, and, so this is this is our strain gauge, which uh, other you know other people have developed stretchable light guides. But we shine light from one end, detect on the other end, um, and then you know we measure strain that way. But what we like about them is they're very simple. Um, we can buy spools of thread and then cut and then insert them anywhere. And so the complexity isn't from the the, the sensors; it's from the framework in which we embed them. This is a and, and we really like. Uh, digital light synthesis as a way to get complex structures quickly and reliably. We think foams are a really great um, paradigm to work with in soft actuators. You get stiffness against gravity, but softness in the way we want, and you can program how things go in there. This is our network of fibers interacting and then our reconstruction of the shape from the raw sensor data. Um, the uh, uh, um, so the, our, our vascular system has to pump blood over huge areas in our, in our body, like enormous amounts of um, contact area between our veins and our, and our muscle. And it does that through fractal networks, which um, manages to um, take it, use the very slow diffusion rates. This is fixed law and this is the diffusion rate that we expect biologically which is very similar to the same diffusion rate that we get in redox flow batteries. And in redox flow batteries are used for grid energy storage, for like really large energy storage. The, 
but um, it, but you have to flow it. You have to keep circulating it because the um, ions will get depleted near the electrodes. And then, so you have to flow it to replenish more ions. It doesn't happen in solid polymer batteries where there's like a bunch of interdigitated layers. And so you get high power um, in, in and to get high power, you need to continuously flow things. In our systems, we're flowing anyway. Um, so it made, made sense to use a liquid battery um, in our robot systems and then build up the structure of the robot to take advantage of that energy density um, to, you know, make, make the, and we chose something to swim because we, you know, we didn't solve the skeletal problem, but that problem other people are solving actually Hui Chen Zhao, who's in, who's at Tsinghua is doing a really good job of this. Um, but it, it would be very possible to print rigid frameworks and overlay soft materials or, or something um, like that. But so um, thank you very much. What I, what I did miss, I had a video in here from Alien, the first movie and in it, that robot is being dissected and there are fiber optics and blood squirting everywhere. So probably I shouldn't have shown it's a bit violent, but uh, I, I think maybe my early Trump traumatization from that movie maybe set me up for this stuff so thank you rob mm -hmm. nice talk and i think uh, it really depends on the time of the day of who's watching our talks right now um so since we're global so it might be tough uh, but you should show me this video once sometime okay um, <laughs> Moving directly forwards, uh, and then we have questions for afterwards because I already have some questions and others will probably have to. Uh, Ryuma, do you want to go ahead and uh, please show us um, your slides? Okay, thank you, Robert. Thank you. Uh, hope you can see the slides. Sounds okay. Uh, I'm Ryuma from the University of Tokyo, and uh, uh, I'm glad to be here. I would like to address a couple of topics with the title, Scalability in Soft Robotics. Uh, here is an overview of the topics. So scalability uh, is about whether or not the soft robotics can grow in, in the broad perspective. Uh, and the soft robots are complex systems, so scalability is technically about the complexity of the fabrication and control. It's, it's mentioned in the discussion session by Rebecca and Pablo. So um, I'm going to talk about what the scalable soft actuator is and how to handle control difficulties in the real world, uh, plus some applications at the end. Let's talk about uh, fabrication complexity. Uh, it's an analogy from the computational complexity. So the uh, claim here is the uh, interesting one. The soft robots are potentially powerful, but too complex. So well, um, soft robots um, often have uh, too many actuators and uh, Look at the illustration on the right, uh, robot arms, uh, different types. A uh, typical articulated robot arm has six degrees of freedom and hyper redundant arm has uh, more, doubled or more. And the continuum arm, soft robotic arm has many active degrees of freedom and uh, infinite number of passive degrees of freedom. So the important point is that uh, the, all, all the engineer knows the cost of creating a system is 100 degrees of freedom system is not equal to the cost of preparing 20 robots with 60 degrees of freedom. Uh, that's why we say simplicity is better than complexity. Uh, but what about biological systems? So the biological muscles are, looks like scalable from tiny insects to the large elephants like mammals. So it's used in everywhere. And it, it looks like there's no, almost no cost to adding actuator. So maybe perhaps we want to say that complexity is better than simplicity. That means soft robots are better than rigid robots. 
Uh, so I'd like to introduce one of our efforts to create a scalable soft actuator uh, we call a pouch motor. So please see the videos. Um, there are linear pouch motor and angular pouch motor, and it's made from two sheets of film and by using a special 2D heat printer, uh, we can weld the films to make a, a complicated shapes of pouch. Uh, then the assembly time and material cost of a classic actuator is maybe proportional or worse than proportional to the uh, number of actuators. In comparison, uh, since the pouch motors are planar and printable, uh, their cost is simply proportional to the area of the sheet, not to their uh, complexity. A, maybe the similar things uh, happen with 3D printable actuators, uh, like mentioned in the uh, Mike's presentations. Uh, their cost is also the proportional to the volume no, no matter how complex they are. So that's that's about uh, fabrication complexity. And next, uh, I would like to talk about control issues. Uh, we have developed a system called the seeding continuum arm because it's this arm is hanged on the seeding, like a seeding fan, and uh, Unlike uh, ordinary continuum arms, this arm can be greatly elongated to allow reaching. So the arms grabs the bolt and moves like a pendulum. And the uh, video on the right, uh, this arm is able to entering into a narrow space. Maybe I think this is one of the uh, typical tasks um, that only soft robots can do. However, uh, here's a caption. These movements are manually created by humans. So many soft robot demos take a lot of human effort. Uh, to, to address this challenge, um, I would like to share our recent work in reinforcement learning of a continuum arm. So um, let, me, let me skip the details, but um, proposed method is based on half policy model free reinforcement learning called SAC, soft actor critic. Uh, soft, um, soft actor critic, uh, soft here is not related to the softness. No. Uh, so we, we use multiple Q networks and uh, multiple policies to handle the uncertainty of soft robots. That's the point. And I'm going to briefly show the result. Um, this is a simulation experiments. The maybe shows that um, after uh, tr several trials, well, hundreds of trials um, in the simulation, the road can uh, learn the reaching task successfully, the red point to the target point. And of course, we have to try in a real system. So uh, in the real robot, the robot is very shaky, uh, but it has successfully learned the reaching after learning. Uh, hope you can see it. The red point of the target and uh, the, the the end of the arms converge to the around the reaching target. So um, this is a preliminary result, but um, we can try model-free reinforcement learning in the real soft robotic systems. 
Um, so from here, in the, in the last few minutes, I would like to introduce a few applications uh, that includes no, no robotic applications. So with Wicked Pouch Motor, a, this is a branch of Pouch Motor project. Uh, we have entered fashion and architecture field. For example, we developed a dome tent uh, covered with over a thousand evacuated flaps. Um, the probably not a good idea to beat it with uh, electric motors. Hundred motors are uh, messy. So, and uh, this wicked pouch motor is activated by ambient temperature. So that's the other good point. So there is no need for power cables. Uh, we made also a dress with um, moving corsage. Um, this is the last slide, but uh, we have also found that inflatable structure using the used in the inflatable robot can be used for vehicles. Um, this is because inflatables are very lightweight and can be folded up so more. So we developed motorcycle uh, shaped vehicles and the wheelchairs showing the video. And we also uh, developed dedicated CAD software for this inflatable um, mobility devices. So we did not uh, made a Baymax, but we made a wheelchair. So um, thank you for listening. This is a summary. Uh, I did introduce some uh, challenges and introduce some applications. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, this was a very nice talk. I would like to use the chance now to give our front row guests um, time to ask some questions. I've been also following the Slido comments and I will be addressing them after my presentation that will follow right after these questions. So Christian, please. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, so yeah. Uh, it's a general question, maybe. So uh, I think I agree with our speaker that the future is probably to go towards uh, rigid and flexible structures and probably with more uh, complex uh, structure that we found in the nature. Um, but um, my question is the following. It seems that to me that the number of control parameters that we found in nature are very numerous. Um, the, I, for me, it's, a, it's a, also a key of, for adaptation. So isn't, in, in a lot of examples we saw in soft robotics, we, limit, often, we often limit the number of actuators. And isn't it a shame to limit this number of, of you know, independent actuators, I would say. And uh, for me, there might be a difference between a design that simplifies the control by putting the robot uh, for instance, in, in natural uh, stable situation or to limit the energy consumption. And it's another thing to reduce the number of control parameters. So for me, there's a difference. When we say we simplify the control, there is these two differences. I don't know, just a question, general question. <laughs> this is uh, Ryuma primarily. Uh, Ryuma, yeah. you want to go ahead? Yep. Um, thank you for the uh, questions. So that that's the also um, I'm interested in. So the uh, control parameters issues. Uh, for example, like our continuum arm only have nine degrees of freedoms, but it's still huge for the reinforcement learning, um, and maybe we need more actuators and maybe hundreds and thousands of muscle fibers. Then, but uh, I, I would say that maybe the uh, mass, number of muscle fibers are, are not equal to the uh, nerves, numbers of nerves. So there should be uh, some kind of synergy between the fibers and maybe nine degrees of freedoms, active uh, degrees of freedoms are emulating some kind of synergy in, in, in this case. But actually, uh, our arm missing the sensors. So number of sensors and number of actuators is kind of limited. I, I, I agree with 
you and we still looking for the publication uh, method for the more complex system that as as the challenge thank you ryuma is there uh, another question um the otherwise actually yeah, one one quick note on my side um christian you're still raising your hands you're good or do you want to ask, ask something else okay uh, no, it's okay. I, Thank you. <laughs> I, the other day I looked up how many muscles are in an elephant trunk and it's like 20,000. So just in the trunk itself without considering the other muscles of the of this animal. Um, so I think in the interest of time, we will have more time to ask questions after this last presentation, which I will have the honor to give. I'm going to share my screen now. I hope is it visible to everyone? Uh, yeah, okay, I see some nodding heads. Um, so in this whole context, I'm going to try to be as brief as possible while quickly touching on soft robotics from the perspective of what I've been doing in the past few years. And I will speak a bit about underwater creatures that go along the lines of what Mike and Cecilia and also Rob had talked about. And we'll also talk about uh, arms, robotic arms, um, very much related to what also Ryuma was showing earlier. And I'm very curious to ask you some questions about your robotic arms that you just showed. So starting off with what always fascinates me, and I, I think some of you have already seen this, this like elegant example of fish being able to swim up the stream and um, I have to say my, my committee chair for my PG thesis, he showed me this video um, during his first lecture in under actuated robotics. And it, it really blew me away when he told me that this fish is actually dead. So it's not alive, it's just dead and it's able to swim up the stream. And so this one single example in my mind encapsulates what none of the existing robotic systems can do it's like you cannot right now build a robot that will just be non-actuated, be really good in swimming up this stream example that's being built here. At least not that I'm aware of it. So what interests me or has interested me in the past so far was looking into underwater creatures and reproducing soft robots that can be continuously actuated, such as a, a system similar to an octopus, not necessarily octopus, but that work underwater and then also things like an elephant trunk that can do things that are not possible with traditional robotic arms, such as reaching around these tight corners and tracing along the wall and finding its food, uh, or even like gracefully and very gently interact with a, with a, small, with a small child without the children around, the, uh, the, the parents around the child panicking that the elephant will hurt that, that child. And so the question is, can we build, reproduce what animals can do so well, which is building flexible, adaptive, and efficient uh, creatures? And so one of the attempts I've made, and this is um, my PhD work for a soft robotic fish, was to use the soft actuators and to build an underwater swimmer. And this was a ton of work to just get to work underwater and still the structure is still so primitive if you think about also what mike was saying earlier it was working well for a particular scenario but you still required a human under the water to give it acoustic commands to do all of this and so here we have this robot it's partially rigid it's partially soft so it has a soft tail in the back that's using hydraulics to pressurize it and then we need all these other components in there and I'm amazed that some of these things have already been replaced now. So for example, in, in Mike's robot, you don't need the electronics anymore. You can just do it all with fluidics alone and you can even put in sensors. I mean, I wanna see how you build a camera using this approach, but um, you can do it already for a smaller dimension by having a touch sensor. And so in this case, combining all of these things and then putting it onto um, a diver interface module that we use the, uh, my, my dream controller as a child, I always like to play Super Nintendo. So we took that Nintendo controller and put it into our diver module and we're able to go underwater and go swim with it. Um, but doing all of this and making this work underwater for a couple of dives 
across the uh, across the, the globe we had to travel 24 hours to get to the place where we had to deploy it it was a lot of uh, losing hair as you can probably see so um and we still don't have a really intelligent robot in front of us. It was able to do it with a single pump actuator. We can go swimming. We can go from, from like, uh, we can go over reef. We can go in three dimensions. We can do somewhat controllable swimming within, with the currents, not against the currents. And we were able to show some pre preliminary results of being able to spy on marine life and see how creatures are reacting to our spy fish, to our spy robot that's trying to assimilate and somewhat get within this, this natural habitat and try to be like a real, a real fish. But we were still much louder. We were having all this motor noise on board. So there's a lot of things to improve. And that's obviously one of the goals in my, in my laboratory now. And so what we're doing and have started doing this during the PhD and also have been doing it more recently, more intensified is how can we better model and optimize soft robots for a particular task? And so the three avenues that I've been looking into is you see it in the top left, we have been working on minimal parameter models that can account for both internal and external forces and actuation and do it all dynamically. And I've primarily only applied it to uh, so elephant-like trunk arms, but I've also looked, and there was work together with uh, Christian's group, Christian Duria's group, who is here on the on this panel today as well. And the, we we looked into how can we use reduced order finite element metal methods to to build ways of controlling and model and control our robotic arms. And what I'm most excited about, what I've been doing more recently. Uh, with a group of collaborators, and this is still under under review, but it's um, I think it's gonna it's gonna be something that we'll be focusing much more on in the future is the ability to do to freeform optimization of structures, so that you can start off with whatever robot you want to build, and you have this limitation that your actuator that you can build might not have the same fidelity or the same numbers of actuators as the real animal has, so you need to adjust your geometry and your control policy because you cannot imitate perfectly the animal. So, but how do you do this efficiently? And this is um, one of the things that we've been looking into. So here you can see that we look into the ability to take a design, a whole spectrum of designs and we interpolate between those designs to find an optimal design. And so we're optimizing both for a geometric space. So we have a way of ge um, geometrically parameterizing our fish creatures. And we also have a way of parameterizing our controller design. So by combining those two, and now we have not just a differentiable simulator, but a very fast differentiable simulator. And this is thanks to people from the computer graphics community. We are able to quickly simulate our structures and optimize it for something like we want to do fast swimming or we want to do elegant manipulation like an octopus can do. So I strongly believe that with this work, we, we're going into a direction and I just want to show you the idea. So this is our, this here is our um, design space that we start off with. We can just take a arbitrary numbers of different creatures and then we interpolate between those creatures and we say, hey, so this is our arrangement of muscles. This is our setup of the space. And then we can say, okay, within this space, we want to find the optimal design and the optimal control policy for this. For example, to do swim forward quickly. So we first start off by, um, and without going into here. So you see that we have the ability to first just do an optimization for control only. So the three basic creatures are not optimized. In the end, we can find a better shape and controller to do faster swimming. And so this only, not only allows us to do better swimming forward, but we can do multiple objectives in this, in this work. Going forward, another piece I wanted to quickly touch on is, so we have gone through a whole evolution of like different designs for soft arms actually so the one that you see here on the left is 2d arm the first time i've published about it was in 2014 but we we reused this arm for a lot of different projects and then we made a 3d arm that was kind of difficult to produce because we're using wax fabrication and my students now kind of cursing at me whenever i ask them to build an arm like this 
And then in the end, we, we now came back to being motivated by some of those original fiber-based designs to build arms. But what really interests us now, and this goes a little bit of what Rob, Rob Shepard has been doing, is how can we inbuilt proprioception and how well does it compare to motion capture systems? So that's what you're seeing here. We cannot only now trace the arm without using external motion capture due to just our dynamic models of the pneumatics and of the um, internal stage uh, shape sensing. But we can also do things like um, we can do force estimation of the structure. We can do like shape reconstruction, force estimation, and be using this as a means of um, building robots that are more integrated and not necessarily require cameras to do things like sensing what they're picking up. And with this, I want to just quickly touch on there's other ways of building robots. One of them is to build these extensible robots. So as you see it here, this is a, a team I've got recently more involved with at ETH, where we are building robots that have deformable structures at the front, and you can use them for rescue applications. This is very much motivated by work from Alison Okamura's group. And we took it to a level where we deployed it in debris and we gave it cameras and other sensor modalities so we actually can make a practical robot that the army can use or a rescue troop can use to, to actually uh, find a person that's in need or in, yeah, in urgent need. And so last, I would like to just summarize um, sort of the different efforts from, uh, from my research group is we, we work on materials and making. I didn't touch this at all today. We do modeling and optimization, and then we build integrated systems like the ones you see here on the right side, fish, arms, hands, and crippers. And I want to thank to all my co-authors during my PhD and my postdoc, and my funders while I was at MIT, and also I want to thank to my, my growing group. This was our socially distant winter walk just uh, not too long ago where we were in Zurich on the mountain and uh, had a good time. And I hope we can do more of these soon again once uh, the situation gets a bit more relaxed. I'm with this gonna be ending my talk and we can directly go over to, um, thank you. We will directly go over to the questions and to also the questions on Slido. So I would say, from this point now we have another at least 15 minutes to to go into questions so i would say who would like to start from the front row to ask more questions and i will open up the slido in parallel so we can also see what our um other attendees want to say and want to ask uh hi robert chu chin here thank you for organizing the nice uh, curriculum it's great to see all of you by face it's really nice and uh, I'm also really glad to see nice works. Uh, and I have so many detailed questions to ask. But um, to align with the theme of uh, this colloquium, which is will software robots be essential for solving the canonical challenges in robotics? And um, I think we are developing a lot of knowledges. We are tools, you know, modeling, fabrication, everything is going up. Technologies, we are building the technology for being able to solve some you know, really important problems in robotics. And I believe when we say we solve the problem, it means that it has become a commercial product. So everyone can buy it and use it. And in terms of that, for example, like robotics, now we see you know, four-legged robotics are starting to you know, come into the market. Uh, AI, you know, it went through a dark age and then now it's becoming you know, commercialized. And I'm always wondering, is soft robotics going to be, you know, like uh, other technologies where we have to go through this dark age and then come back up to be commercialized? Or are we going to see, you know, like our tools being used for solving really important problems of uh, robotics? So in that aspect, um, for example, Soft Robotics Inc. has, you know, started to create a market in Great Versailles. In, for example, in locomotion, manipulation, what do you think? What do you guys think, foresee, um, for example, in locomotion side? What could be the first, the next big thing that you know, everyone can join? If the market is big, then there's a lot of room for research. And I think right now it's an age, it's a really nice time for software robotics researchers. But after 10 years, after we've developed all the tools and there's nothing more to develop, but we don't use it for a good solution, then it's going to go down. 
So I think it's our role, not just to develop these tools, but you know, make sure that we use these tools to solve like really big problems so that our next generation can work, keep on working on you know, this research. Whereas, you know, just like AI, people stopped working on AI because there was no market for it and nothing really worked. So what do you think? What do you think about that? I guess uh, Cecilia. Who likes to take, uh, who likes to take the question here? <laughs> yeah, I think uh, Cecilia has gone through <laughs> the starting the early dark age of soft robotics. And now we are seeing the boom of soft, soft robotics. And uh -huh. I'm not sure how long this will go in the haptics community. I think we are somewhat similar to haptics community where haptics community has boomed, but nothing really big came out. So they're still, you know, maintaining that size and community, but it hasn't been like, you know, autonomous driving, you know, there's, it's been, became really big, you know, drones, it's, it has become really big. So, you know, we need something like that for soft robotics. So what is that going to be? Or, I mean, do you have any idea no. about that? Or, I don't know, do you want to share? No, that, that's, that, that's a very good question, a very good point, a very good analysis that you did that I share completely. Of course, I don't have an, an answer. I don't think anybody can have an answer. Sometimes the market uh, takes... Uh, a, a road that nobody foreseen, for example. I mean, for me, the, the, the drone uh, explosion was completely unpredictable. And uh, so personally, I mean, probably it's even um, beyond the reach of roboticists <laughs> where the market can go. But what I may say is it's where I see that we miss uh, that uh, uh, step of technology to become more solid and more uh, commercial. Uh, and for example, one big point for me is, um, is modeling, modeling and simulation. So that's for Christian, <laughs> uh, because I think, I mean, his work is, is what we need really, because uh, um, we, we know, I mean, I think all of us, uh, we really miss uh, tools. I mean, Christian provided some, fortunately, but uh, um, in order to really, I mean, design, I said control becomes simpler, which means, okay, less parameters uh, to control if you want for some uh, movements. Uh, but design is way more complex in soft robotics. So I'm not saying that soft robotics is simpler than. Um, uh, design is uh, way more complex and, and, and control, again, if we want to control the movements carefully. And that's where we need models and simulation simulators. For, for soft robots that we can use for design, we can use for developing control, for learning, for uh, everything. And I think th this, uh, this missing step in soft robotics technology can, be, can, can, do the, can make the difference for, for going to the market. Thank you, Cecilia. And Christian is giving a thumbs up. Uh, I have one little comment. I was speaking to people from, uh, from Festo today. And I mean, what I have learned from this conversation, they are pushing for soft robotics into their products. But if I look at what they're pushing, it's primarily aspects where it's still a combination of a rigid and a soft structure. So I see, for example, gears in there combined with a soft like actuator and it's the it's a mix of those two and but only if it works for 10 million cycles right then it, then they they like it basically yeah but that's fine i mean soft robotics is not a religion soft robotics is <laughs> having understood that some compliance is helpful somewhere at some point for some movement so that that's fine if we put together i mean rigid and soft materials yeah i like to view us uh the wheelchair with the with the balloon wheelchair, and I'm also like for that you know, hybrid system. We also you know, developed a wheel that can like change, and so I mean, is that going to be commercialized and you know, really be a solution? We'll have to see, but I think that's uh, one option. So I mean, maybe can 
I mean, Robert, you've put up a nice questions. I, I was really uh, impressed by those questions that has to be answered, not just in this colloquium, but you know, something that has to be answered throughout our research. And uh, I think uh, if uh, Robert, also you mentioned you had in your slide, you had a, like a hybrid system. Mm -hmm. you, you mentioned that and then the complexity complexity versus you know how do we use that complexity for solving the you know, problems or is it going to be a hybrid system do you have any like uh, opinion on that it's a very good question and i think the the way to probably solve it is that we get help from industry sooner than later because if i spend a lot of time of just building a robot that is not even close to the capability of what we might see festo filming there, but I rather want to do control studies on it or so, then I could focus on this only and I could research on the topic of how to make a very well produced design more capable. And I feel that's really missing right now, at least from my end, like I cannot buy any of the systems. So whenever I have to do something, I spend a lot of time making instead of like controlling and building skills. And that's where we want to go, right? So, yeah, actually we should have on this panel someone from industry, if I'm thinking about it more. <laughs> I can think of a few examples um, of soft actuator technology used at scale. Like you even, you might even think of it in a robotic sense in, in magneto rheological fluids, tuning the suspensions of vehicles. Um, damping and adjusting feedback control of that, uh, that's a fluid used for control. I think that is a soft actuator technology. Michelin has airless tires, I mean tires, but you know, that, but uh, an advance in that is that they've worked on compliant mechanisms that allow tires to function without air at all. They're, the vehicle though, I don't think has any, you know, feedback mechanism to adjust what it's doing based on how the tires are deforming, but that seems to be something that your system could do. Um, I just, I think that, uh, you know, we, we have a company which is trying to make um, fabrics that send to just put it on everything, robots, people, whatever, because I, I do think that is one thing that we could use. Um, but one of the, pro one of the reasons because I've tried to start a company before on soft actuators, and there's a company called Haptics that is um, doing better than what we tried to do. But we, it was just too complex a system for too narrow a market to try and do it, at least we thought. Um, and the sensors that we make are so simple and so reliable that we thought, okay, lesson learned from the last time, let's try this. And I just think reliable systems that can be produced at scale is what we're missing. Um, so if we have to choose for our future, even though we can do a bunch of things, and I was just saying we should make really complex things, and I think we should, but also as in that effort, identify things that are stupid, simple, and then try your best because the commercialization process is really hard no matter what you're trying to sell. Uh, it has consumed Anyway, it's, it's difficult. <laughs> thank, thank you, Rob, for this. And I'm curious to learn more about the company that you've been involved with. Uh, um, the two questions I'm going to pick up from Slido, so our audience gets gets something to, to ask here. We have um, a lot of upvotes on the question of if we can learn the dynamics of a soft robot. So who would like to answer that question? Can we learn the dynamics of a soft robot? Uh, maybe either uh, myself and uh, Ryuma. I mean, we, we're using a learning-based approaches to, to, to control. And in some cases, we also apply them to, uh, to learn the dynamics of, of the robot. So uh, yes, I mean, the short answer is yes, it is possible. Yeah, and then the follow-up question would be, uh, is it possible nowadays to, to take a soft robot and complete a task like pick and place through a model-based approach? Someone else here on, <laughs> with model-based approaches. 
So I, I would say, yes, it is possible. I've tried it myself before and I've seen other people do it. It's also a question of what you consider to be a soft robot. Is it tendon driven? Is it electromagnetic with some soft elements? So I think we still have to catch up with completely soft hands on this end to do a good job. But other opinions? Yeah, I'll just add, I mean, I see soft robotics in general as an abstraction of robotics, uh, where we essentially throw out the assumption of, of uh, rigid bodies, right? And it's that very assumption of rigid bodies that makes modeling um, so tractable for traditional robots. Um, I, I think as soon as you get into the complexities of, of material constitutive relationships and, and uh, you know, all the details that you have to tackle uh, to control a soft robot, I think um, practically there's going to be some learning involved. And I really like the work of, of Cecilia and, and others in this area. Um, but I don't see them as two different things. I mean, when we talk about can you commercialize soft robots, to me, that question is equivalent to are robotics commercially useful? Yes, and it's gonna you're gonna have to start with the simplest approaches, which is you know like quadcopters uh, are are beautiful because they're relatively simple in in some ways and they're very effective. And I think we're gonna you know as the technology improves and the computational power improves and learning improves, we're gonna see more complex solutions playing a role. Uh, when it comes to like a robotic surgery, do you want the simplest possible? device? No, you want something that, that's very capable. And so I think it's going to depend on the application. Thank you. Um, I have one more question here from the Slido. I would like to see, so, and that's Esther also for you, Mike. In case of actuating soft limbs using cables, how many cables are needed to achieve the cephalopod's dexterity? Yeah, I mean, we haven't done uh, much in terms of, of cable actuated soft robots, although I think it's interesting. I mean, I think that the possibility that's exciting with soft, smart materials is you could have something that looks more like a biological system where you don't have like a small number of actuators or cables, but you have many distributed throughout the system. And if you can digitally manufacture, you can tune, here's exactly where I want this muscle to, to apply tension and forces. Uh, so if you want to reproduce what the octopus does, you need a lot. But I'll, I'll uh, pass this to Cecilia, who's worked uh, more with octopus. Yeah, actually, we tested. I mean, the cables were the first, uh, the first solutions we used for, for the octopus. And uh, let's say in one of the most advanced prototypes, we had 12 of them. Uh, because we wanted to arrange them like in the octopus, which are, which has uh, four longitudinal muscles, but of course, I mean, in three are enough for bending in all directions. But so we put uh, four, and we put uh, uh, them at uh, different lengths in the arm, so three different lengths of cables by four cables uh, was 12. Um, in the assistive uh, robot that we have now, there are actually uh, three for uh, omnidirectional bending, three in each module, then we have three modules, then it's uh, three by three, nine cables, but they are coupled with uh, pneumatic actuation there. So it's more for tuning the stiffness. By the way, I mean, you, you, we, we had a nice bending with 12 uh, in an armor that, that was more or less 40 centimeters in length. Cool, Cecilia, that's uh, very nice. I, I didn't know that. Um, can we also have, I think the front row guests, they might have an opinion on this question. What is your idea for what will be the watershed moments that will be the key change in introducing soft robots to many people? So the watershed moments, I mean, if anyone wants to like um, uh, say, say there like one or two words on this, what will be the thing? Very compact, reliable actuator, controllable, reliable actuator, compact, no noise, <laughs> no noise, <laughs> no noise, compact, reliable, doesn't use much energy. You know, with you know, small battery. Yeah, I mean, we need that to really have this uh, soft robot. Yeah, totally agree. And uh, Rob is saying edge computing. Um, did Rob, you want to say something to that? 
I think one of the reasons we think mm -hmm. that we don't have the right motor, well, one, I, DC microgear motors, I don't see them as a, and I'm not, I don't, I don't see why there's an issue on tendons as calling them soft actuators. So let's just say we can, and you can use a DC microgear motor, which has quite high torque density. You could put these in a bunch of places. Um, but I think the reason we don't think that's a viable solution is it's complicated. Um, it's complicated wiring, it's complicated fabrication, but you could, as you're printing, insert these um, or have, you know, insert them afterwards, but then, you know, and then inject liquid conductors to achieve, to get to them. How do you get the, the threading to them? Uh, we have, and we, this is something we're working on. And I, I think it's, um, I, I think we have the, if we just accept that these little stiff components are the islands of stiffness within the rest of the structure, you can have the continuum and compliance and conformability you want. Um, and, you know, this is, there are a lot of sarcomeres in my, bi in, in anybody's bicep, but, um, you know, we don't need to control them at the sarcomere level to do complicated things. So, well, but the ability to sense local, I think each sarcomere, I, well, sorry, I'm kind of, but there's a biologist here, I don't mean to annoy you, but I think each sarcomere has its own Golgi body or something like that, which measures its own stretch. So we have the ability to sense each fibril, fibril, that's right. Um, and if we need that each, I think if each motor needs to sense or we need to take in a bunch of sensor information like 100, 200, whatever mechano, synthetic mechanoreceptors, then I think we need the ability to do local computation and response um, just to limit the amount of wiring involved in the system. Um, and in that case, we could have our motor our sensor network, our computation, which then coordinates between everything without requiring a mile of wiring to do the complicated thing. Great. Uh, I, uh, I think there's a huge challenge in the machinery for this that we can build such a, such a structure. Uh, Christian or Pablo, Rebecca, do you have uh, something watershed moment like you think? Uh, I will try to, <laughs> to say something. Uh, no, uh, so for me, the, I, I was quite agree that it depends also on the application, I would say. So for instance, uh, for, for surgery, I guess that it will come probably sooner because it's, it's really needed. I mean, uh, we already have, somehow we already have some soft robot. I mean, when you push a catheter and you want to control the catheter inside uh, vessels, you are driving a soft robot, uh, so so, and this is already in the, on the market. Um, so so, I think it it really depends on the application. I really like uh, you know the Vine robot, and and I didn't know the the version that you 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 showed uh, today. Um, I really think like if we can develop uh, a robot that I mean this type of robot shows capability that definitely you cannot do. Uh, with a with a rigid robot, and and then you show not only uh, the same thing as we do. With, I, I mean, when we show a soft robot a trunk with a gripper, we saw the same thing in in rigid. You know, somehow. Uh, but so so people will will be convinced if we have better performance uh, than a rigid a rigid arm. But when you show this vine robot, you show something that is just impossible to do with a rigid robot. And that's make the difference. If you can show an application that is impossible to, to do with a, a, a rigid robot, I think that's definitely when it gets like people will be exciting and probably uh, interested by this. Cool. <laughs> Simple Pablo. response. Maybe. <laughs> Thank you, Christian. Uh, Pablo, do you also have a watershed moment that you think might happen or has to happen? Sure, I'll, I'll throw in my, my, my guess with, with the rest. I think with the capabilities, uh, uh, particularly in materials and chemistry, is something interest, interesting that could affect uh, many or a large market would be uh, wearable power, right? Uh, flexible batteries that you can use for, for many things, right? Like for uh, wearable devices, um, 
things that that you can that can do that that you cannot do with traditional batteries, right? Like uh, wearables that you can wash, that you can wear to camping for days, and that can have higher energy density. That will affect a, a large, a, a very large market, right? So and it might not be a a specific soft robot, but it would be a, a technology that evolved as a result of the a lot of work in soft robotics. Yeah, uh, Rebecca, do you want to say something about fabrics? Um, sure, a actually, um, yeah, thank you for the question. This is a, a really great question. I agree with what everyone has said about the challenges that exist for soft actuators and onboard computing. Um, yeah, and, and certainly we've we've done some work uh, trying to embed functional fibers into, into fabrics for wearability as well. Uh, but something that came to mind through this discussion um, that relates specifically to computing, you know, I, I think we saw in some of the talks today, uh, the application of reinforcement learning, and this is kind of analogous to an approach that my group has been taking with Josh Bungard applying evolutionary algorithms to robots, uh, but these are these are these require a ton of computing power right so we need access to computing cores to apply uh, these these types of approaches and then on the other side there's um you know the things that that mike presented and, and that others have been putting forward with more fluidic logic um, and fluidic logic gates that are much more simplified just because we're at the early stages with soft computing um and so i, I wonder where these things will meet in the middle uh you know if i, I think about um you know, a, a paper that we recently put forward where we applied evolutionary algorithms to a soft robot that could adapt its morphology and behavioral control policies to a changing environment. So the robot, you know, is in a new environment, it needs some kind of representation of that new environment, and then it would search for, use evolu evolutionary search to find, you know, what is my ideal morphology and gait to uh, locomote it most efficiently in this environment. And, you know, of course, the forward thinking idea is that the, the robot would be able to do this itself in the future, but will the robot actually have access to <laughs> computing cores? Uh, you know, how much compute do we actually have to have on board to, to realize this? But it's, um, I, I think it's an exciting uh, idea or an exciting path forward because I, I see one of the major um, applications or promises for soft robot is, is the idea that, that it can adapt its morphology, that soft mater materials can be used um, so that the robot can change its resting morphology uh, and adapt to these changing tasks and environments in the future. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, so we are uh, at the time that I would just show the, the slide for the next panel. Um, so the next panel will be, the next colloquium will be in the, um, in a few weeks and this yeah let me just show it share it with you briefly so it's gonna be on april 1st at 4 p.m central european summertime and it will be titled from human robot interaction to human robot integration and the speaker for that colloquium will be antonio bicchi and it will be moderated by danica grajic and with this um i know some of you have to get going and um I think we should then at this point wrap it up. Thank you so much for joining this panel today. It was a, a great pleasure to have you all on here to see the newest work that you're working on. There's probably hundreds of questions we could be going on and we have to take them another time. Uh, thank you so much. Rob, thank you. Bye, everybody. I, Thanks. <laughs> if I can just make a, a quick plug before we go, Rob, we also have the RoboSoft conference coming up next month. So uh, sure. anyone who's watching this may be interested in checking yeah. out uh, Soft Robotics yes. Conference. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, just remind the, di the dates. I don't have them on the top of my head. What are the dates? Uh, Mike? April 12th to 16th. Okay. Cool. Thank you all. Um, thank you all for joining and have a great morning, evening, night. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>